how good this is to be here, to see many familiar faces, friendly, unfamiliar faces. Welcome. Thank you for coming out tonight. And it's a great pleasure to be here with my friend of 35 years, Stanley Crouch. And um, I just echo what Maureen said, y'all need to buy the book and read it. And because you can talk about uh, this book in abstract terms and talk and need to tell me, we will talk about it a lot this evening about what's going on in the book, what was going on with Charlie Parker, but the book itself, the reading of the book itself, uh, in purely literary terms, is uh, an extraordinary experience. And uh, I want to just read the opening, uh, the opening of the book proper, because one of the things I think that's so important about this book is very often when we think of Charlie Parker, I think when a lot of people think of Charlie Parker, um, we think of the great virtuosic post-World War II improviser, uh, urban figure playing in New York City and cutting his way through uh, uh, post-war reality with this blazing new form of music. But Charlie Parker came from someplace and he came out of a context. And one of the things that this book does so extraordinarily well is it tells you something about that context, not just the context of uh, Kansas City, where Charlie Parker was from, uh, but the entire context of the history of the American West and Midwest. Uh, and it's a tour de force, intellectual tour de force, and also a literary tour de force. So let me just read you uh, the opening page, just so you can get a little bit of a sense of the texture of the prose. And then uh, I want to talk to Stanley about how he came to write this book. Um, what the genesis of the book was a little bit. I want to get him to talk a little bit about his understanding of Charlie Parker as a figure in American culture, and then I want to talk a little bit about the relationship of Charlie Parker to literary questions, more specifically literary questions. But let me read you this opening of this book. One Sunday, and Charlie Parker is a member of this group of musicians you're going to encounter. One Sunday morning, unseasonably warm for December, a group of musicians sat on the curb in front of a rooming house in Des Moines, Iowa. Des Moines was one of the stops on what was then known as the Balaban and Cat Circuit. If you were a musician in the 1930s, the circuits took you through different cities, different landscapes. The Balaban and Cats, for instance, took you out of Kansas City and up to Lincoln, Nebraska, then to Omaha, over to Des Moines, north to Minneapolis and St. Paul, back down through Madison, Wisconsin, over to Milwaukee, south to Chicago, then to Springfield, Illinois, moved on to St. Louis, rolled you into Jefferson City, Missouri, and then back to Kansas City. You heard not just different music, but different language on the circuits, and you saw different women along the way. It was an adventure, always, but the miles and the fatigue were worth it. When you got out of those cars and stretched, spruced up if you had the time, sauntered into those halls, set up your instruments, fixed the wooden folding chairs in place, took out the music, tuned up, relaxed, and later unleashed the nappy neck lightning of jazz. Then you came alive in a very special way. Then glamour, grace, and audacity could ramble from your instruments. Then your mind could shine like Klondike gold. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's a sense of something. So the kind of extraordinary, just lyrical wham that you get from this book, starting at the absolute starting gate. And also, you notice that last little reference to shining like Klondike gold, which is a little allusion to Big Joe Turner's um, uh, lyrics from uh, um, uh, Roland Peake, which is a Kansas City standard. So there are all these little musical and uh, you know, allusions in the book that function in a very literary way uh, as references, and it's just done so beautifully. So anyway, Sam, I wanted to start by asking you, how did you, <laughs> how did you kind of come to this material? Now you've been, when did you start? You started this book a long time ago, started interviewing people about Bird. Why Bird? How did you come to the material? What was the genesis of the book? Well, I came to it. I came to it because I was, uh, because I, I saw Clint Eastwood's movie. <laughs> and Did you like I it, Stanley? It. <laughs> In fact, you and I saw it together. Yeah, with Walter Bishop Jr. And it was 
such a hatefully narrow, well-minded, well-intended, I mean, picture of Charlie Parker. But it was, it was like this movie that's out now, 12, 12 Years a Slave. Mm. It's the perfect, we, it and Bird go together perfectly because the person seems so traumatized by life that the person just becomes a talking version of livestock. And that's, what, that's why everybody loves that movie because they always love movies in which you have a very simplistic understanding of black American experience. Oh, well, those colored people, you know. Now, you don't think that that those colored people actually produced Frederick Douglass, whom Lincoln said, given where Douglass came from, he was the most extraordinary man in the United States he had ever met. Lincoln, who was one of the most extraordinary people who was ever born in America. And he was that impressed by Douglass, who began as a slave. And so, so that if somebody like Lincoln beating Douglas, that told him more about slavery than anything else, probably. That whatever we think about it, there are people like him among them. And we have to deal with that. So somebody like Lincoln, who knew, as Saul Bellow pointed out in one of his books, uh, well, <coughs> If you if you're gonna be a, if you're gonna run America, you have to be able to tell good jokes. <laughs> and and what I mean is that that Charlie Parker is such a reflection of, of, a, of a very rich cultural background. Not not only ethnic, but 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 the the culture itself was was extremely alive and very important to everybody who was here. And it was important to, to, to everybody who wanted to be modern anywhere in the world. And so what I mean is, I was talking to some to some writer sometime in, in the 70s or the 80s, and he was telling me he was doing some piece in Africa for National Geographic or some magazine. And he went into these mud huts and he would there were two two photographs that he would always see in these mud huts. And so I said, Who are they? He said he said, Charlie Chaplin and Muhammad Ali. <laughs> Charlie Chaplin? Yeah. He said he said, he said everybody in the world knows that Charlie Parker Ch Charlie Chaplin is funny because you don't have to speak the language to 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 to, to understand that he's comic and he's a, he's a, he's a great performer and a great athlete. He can do all of that stuff, and you don't have to understand what words he's he's still talking. And this, and, and by that point, one of the best actors in the world was obviously Muhammad Ali. You know, one of the biggest frauds, but it's fun. it's okay. It's okay because what he could do, he did do it. I mean. He won against George Foreman. That's what he did. All of this stuff is, yeah, all the rest of it is fraudulent, but it's okay. So, so Charlie Parker fits because he, see, see, what he actually did was he, he conquered his own limitations because he discovered something in himself that he didn't know about it to start. Because he actually couldn't play. Now what I mean is when you, when you when most people encounter musicians as great as Louis Armstrong or Charlie Parker, people think that they could always play him. Mean, if you just handed them a horn and then they suddenly suddenly No. That's not true of any music or any musicians. You see, because Charlie Parker, the fact that Gene Ramey was there the night that Charlie Parker got up and tried to play mm -hmm. and could not play because you he... want to tell that story? Well, see, it's Gene Ramey was there. Gene Ramey was the bassist with the Jay McShann Orchestra. Yeah, he, he was one of the major sources in the book. 
and he was there with a woman named Countess Collins, who was one of Mary Lou Williams' competitors in Kansas City. As a piano Be player. Yeah, see, in Kansas City, they actually didn't. I mean, you know, there's, there's a, you know, t today is it's it's a there's a convenient hustle to say, well, they were always great women musicians. Now, no great women musicians ever told me that. <laughs> None. Mary Williams, Ella Fitzgerald, they never said that. Betty Carter, they never said, there were always a lot of us and we couldn't, we couldn't get out because the guys wouldn't let us. That's garbage. So what I mean is, when Collins Collins was sitting there with Gene Ramey, they were just at an after, after I was uh, jam session. And Charlie Parker walks in there with a saxophone, and he's going to sit in. And how old was he? How old was he? He was one? 16 or so. Uh. But he had, he had concluded that he could play. <laughs> Based on what? Based, Based on, on him being Charlie Parker. He knew part of two songs or something, right? Yeah, he did, he, he, Honeysuckle he, Rose. You know, part of Honeysuckle Rose and part of Body and Soul. Right. Not, not Body and Soul. A lazy lazy river. river, and he later on said that there was no conglomeration that would make those tunes that he knew fit body and soul. <laughs> and so he gets up there. And he just say, he, the, the, when they look at him, they point him. He walks up and starts playing what he knows, which didn't work at all. <laughs> and then Joe Jones, who was a drummer, a very impatient guy if you didn't get it because see he see the see at that time there was um, a radio show called major bowls and it was it was like an amateur show and, and if, if if you if you you know later on they had a television version of it called the bong show where people would perform or do something and then somebody would Gong them off stage. If they and, weren't, if they weren't cutting it, they would get the gong and yeah, they dragged off. Yeah, and so you know, Gene Ramey says that it, during that time, pe people would say, "Ding, ding," <clears throat> to you. If they thought you were lying, they would. They would. If if, if you if you were, if, if they thought you were lying, they would listen to you and then they would say, "Ding, ding." <laughs> and that means that I think you're lying. And so, so Charlie Parker is playing, and Joe Jones just goes up to the bell on the cymbal, and he goes, ding. Charlie Parker, he's swing. And he goes, ding, ding. Charlie Parker is still playing. And he goes, ding, ding. And Charlie Parker is still playing wrong. And finally, Joe, Joe, Joe Jones can't stand it, and he takes the symbol off of the symbol stand and throws it in front of Charlie Parker, and bang! And Charlie Parker looks around him and starts moving off stage, and everybody starts laughing. He got the gong. Yeah, they gonged him off. <laughs> so, but that was good for Charlie Parker because he was so angry that he decided he said to people, I decided that night I was going to become one of the greatest saxophone players in the world. You know. Okay, can I ask you a question? Now, this moment, this is a very nodal, obviously, moment in his development, or really in the development of anybody who's an artist, I think. There's that moment where somebody gives you the gong. You right. Know, and right. then you have to decide, do I really want to take any more of this abuse? Or right. maybe I should go back to business school, or whatever it might be. Right. Right. right? So, this book, Kansas City Lightning, covers Charlie Parker's developmental years up until he's just about to step onto the great stage, right, of public awareness. So would you say that set of transactions he had to go through in his own mind, in his own spirit, uh, is the real theme of this book as far as Charlie Parker, as far as the character of Charlie Parker goes? Well, well, what you have to do to become an artist? Well, the thing is, he didn't, see, he didn't 
know anything about what you had to do, what you had to go through. Now he knew what he wanted to be, but he, he wanted <coughs> to be up there with Lester Young and Colvin Hawkins and Chewberry and Armstrong and Roy Elders. He knew he wanted to be up there, mm -hmm. but now he didn't know the problems of going up the ladder. See, he, you know, he, now you can look up to to another floor, and you can kind of miss the ladder, <laughs> and you don't really feel it. You almost, you, you, if you're far enough away, you can think, oh, well, that looks like you could just run up there and jump up there. But when you get closer, you realize there's a ladder, and you have to climb up the ladder. And by the time Charlie Parker got close enough to the music, he could see, oh, you have to climb all these steps. But, but to Charlie Parker, that was when he discovered who he actually was, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. because, he, because he was, a very spoiled kid. Spoiled kid? Spoiled, but he wasn't, but he, but he, but he, nobody who actually knew him, they, they said he was very spoiled. His mother bought him tailored suits and all that. But he was a guy who nobody ever described <laughs> as a punk. That is, if you, if you like Sterling Bryant had a girlfriend, in Kansas. Now the, pe the the guys in Kansas didn't like the guys in Missouri coming over and going out with their what what, what they considered their women. And so Sterling Bryant had a girlfriend in Kansas. And so he said You mean the Kansas side of Kansas City? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And so <laughs> so he says he said, he said Charlie would walk over there with me. I'd go over there. He'd go. He'd walk. He did walk with me. And he said, and he didn't run. He never ran. If we had to fight, he was there. You could always count on it. Whether whether we won or we lost, he stayed. That was it. That was what happened. Now the thing is that see, now when now that was the that was the young Charlie Parker. See, Charlie Parker, the dope fan, he would avoid confrontation because dope fans don't want to do, you know, I mean, they don't like to do anything except shoot dope. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's something like, oh, we're going to, we have to go over there and we have a fight over at the corner. And they'll, the dope fan will say, well... <laughs> There must be another way to handle this. <laughs> not not necessarily out of out of cowardice, but out of of not feeling up to it. It's like you know, you know, because one of the things dope, uh, dope fiends love to say is, "Man, you you fucking with my high now. <laughs> now you fucking with my high. We were all right until we got to this point, and now you're saying something that is." ruining my high. I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to do it. So uh, Charlie, that Charlie Parker came later. But when he was young, he had, see, whatever that was that kept him from running when he was, when he was going with his friend Sterling Bryant into Kansas, that stayed in him. And that, it seems to me, took him through what he had to go through to master the saxophone and to master all of those kinds of chords and to learn all those tunes which he which which he he see the the basic thing about him is that is the same thing that's true about any painter, you know, any actor, any dancer. Whatever they do <laughs> Whatever they're doing when you see them is always the result of everything else that they did. Mm -hmm. What I mean is any, is any musician is a, who, who can play, what, what that musician is playing then is the result of everything that musician has ever played. Good, bad, stupid, 
yeah, bring it one way or the other. Yeah, so it, that's always part of it. And so what I mean is that part of what the book shows is that the way these guys got to, to where they were in Kansas City was they played all of the time. They played at night. They played in the early early morning. They played sometimes until noon the next day. They were always playing. Isn't that the way jazz musicians always are in cities? Was there something different about Kansas City in that respect? Well, the thing about Kansas City that was different was that Kansas City was so corrupt that nothing ever closed. <laughs> and so, and so what I mean is that, that, that like Johnny Tamino, uh, the, the uh, manager of the Jay McShan band that we, that we meet at the beginning of the book, uh, which Charlie Parker is a member of, he said to me, he said, he said, he said, in Kansas City, nobody had locks for their doors because they never closed. <laughs> so, 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 so once the once the room opened, it stayed open. You know, it, you know, it just never closed. He said, so he said, so he just made it a joke. Like he said, lock in Kansas City for what? <laughs> You know, throw the lock away, you're never going to close the place. So that was it, you know. Could you talk a little bit about the, about not just the Kansas City environment, but you, you <coughs> spend a lot of very fruitful energy in the book uh, sort of sketching in the deep background of the landscape that Charlie Parker came out of, that, that produced a certain stance in the musicians, certain attitude toward life, now, you talk a little bit about some of the things that you're touching on with that, from the conquistadors up through. T talk a little bit about how, because it's very unusual to encounter a jazz book, that, you know, a book about a jazz musician that has this kind of context and sweep to it. Well, the thing is that, the, that, that all of the books that I read, they, they kept telling me the same kind of a thing. That if you if you were in the Midwest, if if you decided to come the distance to be in the Midwest, that made you a special kind of person in this regard. That you had to be tough to be there. Uh -huh. See, because the women who who came west, see see they really get they really get a fraudulent deal in 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 in, in westerns. Because they didn't ride in the wagons, they walked. So the so these women, they're central to the reason the West was was settled, because they walked from Philadelphia to Dodge City, and then when they got to Dodge City, the first thing they told the guys was they said, "Look, we are not." Now, if you leave men alone, they'll do two or three things. You all are going to have to get a, get a grip on them. We know what you like to do. You like to kill each other. You like to drink liquor. And you like whores. But you know what? We're going to build some schoolhouses and we're going to do all of that. <laughs> <laughs> so and so, so the, real, the real thing that happens in the West is that, is that people fought the Indians, yeah, that was happening. And they endured all of these, these complex terrain, shifts of terrain, all of the droughts, they endured all of the, the, of, of, of the rainstorms, they endured all of it, but at a certain point, they decided that they, that they were not going for certain things. And those people be, became the Westerners, and they had the same attitude that, that, that suffused all of the ethnic groups in the Midwest. It, it got because at the point when when the when the when the black people get out of slavery after 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 the Civil War, then they went in in the in the in the cavalry. And so 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 all of those guys, all of those families that, that you see of these black people who were moving to the West, they moved to the West because they wanted to be done with the South. Uh -huh. 
See? And so, so, so the first thing was they said, okay, where can we go that we're going to have to deal with some people, some white people who are different than these white people? And so they said, oh, I, oh, there's a guy, he, he's taking a train of people up to Kansas. Really? Yeah, we're going up there. Really? Yeah, we can go. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not. It's not like it is here. They said, "Let's go." Right? And so what I mean is, is I tell all of those stories in the book to 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 make it make it clear to the reader that Charlie Parker, Lester Young, Count Basie, all of those people are the result of a, of, of a number of of historical moments. In American culture, but they also led to different kinds of things. Like they led to, to to the blues. They led to ragtime. They led to, to to early jazz. All of those people brought about the same thing: that 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 those things that began in slavery, they ended up evolving into this complicated and very sophisticated art form. Because one of the ways that, that I became friends with, with Ralph Ellison as a you know a younger minor figure, right? Who <laughs> was was I was talking to him once, and, and uh, I said, "Well, you know, I think that there were there was a a double identity, like what uh, Du Bois calls a double consciousness." That was very ironic about this the 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 this, the music doing slavery, and Allison said, "Oh, you think so, huh? How is it unique?" And I said, "Well, on the one hand, it was a signal to other slaves that the Underground Railroad was coming through, so slaves would sing these different songs that told other slaves." If you're leaving, get ready to leave. They're mm. coming through. Mm. I said, now, that was entertainment to the people who owned the slaves. <laughs> but that was also the beginning of an extremely powerful music that began to change American musical expression. And Allison said, oh, so you figured that out, did you? I said, I, said, I might have. And he said, so, so what I mean is, that's part of what we see in, in, in that whole section, yeah. is, that, is that everything that happens historically leads to something, good or something bad. It always does. But usually when we get um, a background that includes black and white people, then it usually sinks down into... Uh, a condescending and articulated use of the data to say, well, those black people, they just, they weren't allowed to become human. And, and so I wanted to make it possible for the reader to see why all of the people in Charlie Parker's world did not accept that. Mm -hmm. And they didn't express them of their lives like that. And they didn't look at themselves like that. I mean, their fundamental vision was one of, of, of what I call heroic optimism. Mm -hmm. And that to me is the sound that you hear in swing. If you hear, if there is a sound of heroic optimism, it's the sound of swing. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. it's like okay, this is this is what we got to deal with. You know what we gonna do with it? We gonna swing it. 